My name is Steve Wald. I'm a director of government relations for the College of ACES, which I probably don't have to spell out here. That's the College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences here at University of Illinois. Um, absolutely thrilled to be here and have the opportunity to sit with this illustrious panel. And I, th I think if I understand the history of Ag Tech Week, this is the first time there's been a policy panel, so it's a, a special thrill for me to be um, a part of this. Um, and yeah, just, just to get started, this is a farm bill year. Um, technically, last year was a farm bill year, and if we really drill down on it next year, maybe a farm bill year too. <laughs> um, but uh, for me, as thinking about this panel, um, we're all familiar, many of us are familiar with farm and ag policy, and when it pertains to the farm bill, topics like crop insurance, and conservation programs come up. But this is Ag Tech Week, and we're, not, we're gonna talk about ag tech policy. Uh, the impact of policy on ag tech, on our industries, on our research, um, on the farms, and on the, uh, on the production of food. <clears throat> and that's, that's going to be the focus that we're going to dive into here. So um, how does policy shape and influence ag tech innovation? Its deployment, its focus, its direction. In what ways do government programs encourage or stifle uh, the ag tech sector? And how does enthusiasm for or concern or even fear about new ways of growing food shape policy? Um, we're going to take a dive into those topics over the next half hour. And, but I'm going to get started by introducing this kind of dream team of uh, people representing three sectors, industry, government, and academia. And we'll just go down the line here. If you guys want to um, just get us started by introducing yourself, say a little bit about your background and what brought you to what you're doing now, then, then we'll really get into it. So, Greg? Thank you, Steve. My name is Greg Webb, and I work for ADM. I've been doing that for 37 years, actually. So I really enjoy working with a world-class company like ADM. Um, how I got to where I am today, I started out as a grain merchandiser, as many do in our company and then had the privilege to live and work in several communities. And after spending seven years in Canada, got acclimated to things beyond soybeans, because I was in our soybean crushing operation. And when I returned back to the United States in 1999, I was involved in our what we call minor oil seeds, canola, sunflower, flax, cottonseed. Not top of mind for a lot of Illinois, Iowa, uh, Indiana farmers that might in this part of the woods. And what drove me to public policy was, for those of you who were involved in the industry in the turn of the century, it was not a pleasant time for agriculture. And for especially minor oilseed producers, it was especially difficult because the Farm Bill, as Steve uh, mentioned early, only kind of covered corn, soya, um, and, and wheat and cotton. And if you were growing some of these other minor oilseed crops, it wasn't a pleasant time as we were wanting to encourage people to still plant. So I got to where I was spending quite a lot of time on public policy trying to encourage and bring visibility that the production of these other seeds is equally important. So one thing led to another. ADM has operations in 34 states. We had no one devoted to public policy in any of the states that we operated. So. So uh, that became an opportunity for me, and while I do miss the uh, profit and loss statements that drive your businesses every month and every year, I am invigorated by the breadth and depth of a company like ADM that gives me opportunities to be involved in lots of different topics, some things I know something about, and many topics I know very little about. Thanks very much. Lexi. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Alexi. Uh, I'm here from Washington, D.C., where I work in Congresswoman Nikki Budzinski's office um, as an ag policy advisor. Um, and this is the area she represents, so it's really fun to be here. Um, I got into ag policy actually as a result of, by chance, taking a class with Jonathan, um, so it's fun to sit with him here today. Um, I was a COVID kid in undergrad, and that was the only class offered in person in the whole department, and I thought it would be, you know, why not take it? And now here I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so I, I'm in my first job out of college, so I don't really have a great story of how I got here other than the job came open. I thought, wouldn't it be so cool if I got that job? Um, but I can ex you know, speak a little bit to why I like to work in policy, and I think that's because 
Um, I have a unique role in that most people that talk to me day to day truly and deeply care about what they do. You know, like most people aren't going to fly out to Washington, D.C. to talk to the staff of a member of Congress if they don't really care about that issue. And that's really rewarding. And I think for me, because I get to do agriculture, which is something I was raised in and went to school for twice, is infinitely more rewarding. Um, and I think in a world of increasing polarization, which I don't want to you know, be dismissive of the fact that that's a real problem, that does not really happen in the ag tech space. And so that's really rewarding as well. Um, I think there's a general consensus, you know, regardless of your ideology, that we want America to be leaders um, in ag innovation, whether that's plant genetics, um, you know, other types of biotech, biomanufacturing, you name it. Um, I think that everybody is, you know, sort of on the same page. And so it's a really great place where we can come together across the aisle and make real change that, you know, might actually someday become law. Um, you know, as Steve said, it's a farm bill year, theoretically. And, you know, like I laughed because I really wanted to come out to D.C. and I was really worried I was going to make it for the 2023 farm bill. <laughs> and now it's 2024 and no farm bill in sight. Um, but, you know, we're still hopeful and, and excited. So thanks, Steve. Jonathan. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, Jonathan Kappas. I am an associate professor in the Department of ACE, Agricultural and Consumer Economics. However, I am not an economist, so don't hold that against me or expect too much from me. Um, I, uh, well, I made a few wrong turns from my family's farm to here, uh, including a good stint in Washington, D.C. Well, I got, got to work on a couple farm bills. And out here at the university then, I teach promising young students like Alexi uh, or try not to you know, mess up their careers and, and goals in life. Um, and I work a lot on agricultural policy. So in, in particular, you know, the bad writing and awful graphs on Farm Doc Daily that we put out and try to make sense out of, uh, uh, out of the policy realm and the farm bill mess, uh, which is a lot of, of what my focus is. I, you know, I came to this I'd practiced law in Chicago for a while um, before going out to D.C. and getting involved in, again, kind of what Alexa said, something you're interested in, something you care about and uh, can throw yourself at, you know, sometimes for 20 hours a day as you work through it. And so the, uh, that opportunity was amazing. I, I encourage students all the time to get some time in D.C. and get a sense of exactly what you said, which is it's an incredible environment of people who are very passionate about what they work on and put a lot of time into it even when that work and time isn't producing what we might read about in, the, in, in news uh, as far as the outcomes go. Um, and then out here, like I said, it's been an incredible opportunity to dive deep into some of the history and some of the development around these policies and a little bit to what Greg was saying, you know, how is it that we come to the, the point in early 2000 where we needed to expand some of these programs and how do we, you know, going back to Stephen, how do we think about ag tech and policy? So I will stop there and hand back over. Thanks for having me up. Again, thrilled to have all you guys here. And we're going we're gonna to nip into this a little bit but with just a framing question. I think we're, we're all familiar with last century's experience with ag tech, mechanization, synthetic fertilizer, and hybrids. Combined to increase yields fourfold, farms grew larger. Uh, the population involved in farming dropped from over 50% to maybe around 2%. Um, is today's ag tech a continuation of those trends, or is it something different? I just want to kind of have you reflect on that a little bit. Let me give you an industry perspective, because the first thing that comes to my mind, and partly it's selfish because I spend a lot of time on it, is on decarbonization efforts. So I think of about a company like ADM with a long value chain where we start with the farmer. And so one of the things, like a lot of other companies that we've engaged, is regenerative agriculture. Definitely a product of public policy. And we were benefited to be one of the many recipients to be a part of the USDA's Climate Smart Program. And so our, our award is that we work in 16 states and that we have developed cooperators in each of those states to help facilitate working with growers, adopting uh, a variety of different kinds of programs. What I'm most proud about our regenerative program is that we meet the producer where they are. If they've been no-till farming for 40 years, terrific. We don't, it's not gonna be a penalty for, for that individual to be a part of our program. Or contrast that to someone who has been you know, doing things in a different way, and they might have substantial gains to be made in their regenerative uh, outcomes. And then if you kind of go through our value chain, 
uh, through our operations, through our origination, when we get to the end, we are also, uh, for the last more than a decade, we've been capturing the CO2 off of our fermentation stream in our Decatur, Illinois operation. And this was kind of tip of the spear back in 2011, and we were benefited to work with a very fine Illinois State Geologic Survey here, housed at the University of Illinois, now under the auspices of the Prairie Research Institute. But we have a terrific geology in the southern two-thirds of Illinois, western Kentucky, and western Indiana that allow for permanent storage of CO2. Billions and billions, if not tens or hundreds of billions, of tons of, of storage for this product. And so our agriculture industry is responding back to this, partly because capturing CO2 off of a fermentation stream of corn that that plant captured while it was growing is a pretty pure stream. It's 99% pure CO2. So really all we're doing is just stripping the water off of the product for permanent injection. And, and so as we think about you know, in our value chain, what can we do to have an impact? Those two bookends kind of feature what we're all about. And just for context, by the way, since 2011, ADM has injected just under four and a half million metric tons of CO2. And now that we have the Inflation Reduction Act, yet another public policy outcome at the federal level that is providing an emphasis not only on carbon capture and storage, but another prominent feature of that was sustainable aviation fuel. I think what our job is to help people understand that those are interdependent technologies. People get pretty excited about sustainable aviation fuel as an outcome because for our airline industry, that's one of the very few compliance mechanisms available. But the only way from an agricultural perspective that you create a fuel that is SAF eligible, which is at least 50% less of the baseline carbon intensity of the, of the um, petroleum product, is to have carbon capture and storage. And so for, for many of us who think about these subjects in may, maybe silos, there is an interdependency here that I think is important to understand to help agriculture realize uh, some of this opportunity. Jonathan or Alexi? Well, I, I'll try to do this in uh, three points without getting lost in any single rabbit hole. Um, so I, I, your question about history and this continuation, right? There's a trend, uh, there's recycling going on here, and there's some new aspects. So the trend, right, from hundreds of years past, from animal to mechanization to some of the chemical inputs and the, and, and the advancement we've now seen with precision technology. So that kind of thing continues, a lot of displacing of labor and so forth. The recycling, again, are some of the challenges we see time and again with these advancements in technology. So whether that's soil erosion or water quality impacts or some of the natural resource concerns and challenges come around it, we recycle and then have to kind of figure out um, how to adapt. I do think uh, something that Greg said that really is probably the new and maybe the biggest risk component of this that policy needs to consider is the impact from climate change and how climate change is going to uh, disrupt and cause whatever issues it's going to cause down the road where our general trend and some of our recycling may not actually um, repeat <laughs> as, we, as we might think. So I think those three things kind of play into that history of, of what we've seen and where policy then steps in, obviously some of our next set of questions probably, but where, where that can come in and how that can play a role is important. And I can also just speak briefly to the policy side of things. Um, Greg, I think what you talked about with like IRA and sustainable aviation fuel being part of that, um, you know, I think policy is trying to sort of meet the moment, um, but also, you know, be cognizant of the fact that myself and my colleagues are not science professionals. So it can be really difficult to write good policy for, you know, emerging technologies um, and, you know, emerging science. And so that's why conversations like this are always so important is because you know, we can, we can write the Chips and Science Act all day long, we can write the Inflation Reduction Act, but if it's not going to actually be useful to the folks who need it, um, then, then that's a problem. And I think we got it right with those two things, but that's not the end of the road. Thank you guys for that. We, I am gonna shift gears a little bit now and, and uh, open up another thread here. It, um, 
it has to do with the driver of those policies and what ends up kind of setting those societal goals alongside the market goals that help drive uh, tech innovation. Um, each year we see bills introduced intended to address an environmental or an ethical or a social concern related to the food system. Um, many of which are directly related to technology itself and some of which call on technology to help meet that goal. Um, from your perspective, and I'd love you to consider where you're situated in the, in the ag food um, innovation ecosystem here, what more can be done uh, to ensure that we strike the appropriate balance between, um, I guess, caution and progress when it comes to technology in the ag sector? All right, you're looking at me, so I guess I'll try to uh, try to get a response out. So I think there's there's a couple things to keep in mind, and, and one of the things I talk about or sometimes verge on the edge of preaching about is, first off, policy is a very blunt instrument, right? It's a very blunt instrument, so you have to calibrate your expectations of that reality. And I think there are two things that are really important, and one of these will be obviously very self-promoting, but the single biggest and best thing that policy can do is the investment in research development the investment getting research applied and out the door and into the hands of those who can use it, I think that investment, um, and obviously I, but at this university, but I think that investment is probably one of the most important things that policy can do. On the flip side of it, I think, again, realizing that it's a blunt instrument with a lot of challenges around it, that the best we can expect, I think, is often that it can um, not get in the way of innovation or at least help foster and encourage innovation. and re and. I hesitate to even say reward, but really open up that possibility so if you consider the risks to the innovator, the, the challenge to the farmer taking on new practices and changing what they're doing, like what Greg's talking about with carbon issues and uh, sustainable agricultural challenges, like those, those are big risks in a farming operation, particularly in the first few years. One of the ways our policy can do a lot better, in, in my opinion, is to actually foster that innovation better and encourage it, but also you know, at least not punish it or, or hold it back. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Jonathan on that. I think that policy can't really answer these questions for you, but they can answer them as a result of, you know, other pieces of legislation. Um, with sustainable aviation fuel, for example, it wasn't like Congress came together and was like, what if we could make better fuel out of soybeans? Like, we didn't come up with that. Um, you know, industry came up with that and researchers came up with that. And I think we have an investment problem. We are falling behind in terms of investment into agricultural research. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we personally are big advocates for, but also um, the, the things that come out of universities are, are incredible. Um, most of our, you know, most important agricultural research is done at land grants like this one, and so I think reinvesting in that um, is a policy in and of itself, and then we can then meet the next step once we find out uh, what we find out. Yeah, I appreciate your, both your comments about this. I think as an industry participant, we have identified three macro trends of the world that our company is focused on. Food security, health and well-being, and sustainability. And I think what, how we approach some of the, as, as Jonathan described it, the blunt instrument of policy at some times, is that you identify these areas of focus, and as public policy may arise or may get in conflict, you have to be aware of that, but I don't think, you know, industry can wait for policy. I think you have, you have these elements of how you're operating, and then you remain sensitive as things develop. And, you know, the third one I mentioned is sustainability. People have 27 different uh, uh, definitions of what that means, and so I think it's important that, that we have a path forward, but we have both the agility and flexibility to fit within whatever public policies may occur, whether it's here in the United States, and because we're a global operator, we have to mean, remain pretty flexible around the rest of the world. So I want to put the room on notice that we are doing questions. I'm going to squeeze in one more, uh, just real quick, and it um, has to do with what we all do for a living day to day, the practice of uh, policy communication and decision making. and. I imagine that's true across the room too. So if you could offer the, um, you know, the businesses and the scholars in the room um, a takeaway on, just from your perspective, what else or what more could we be doing in the policy arena to make the process um, more efficient, more effective for themselves and for everyone? I wanna jump on this because you know I work in government. Um, 
I would just say from where I'm at, there is no conversation too small. Um, I've had really great ideas come out of one-on-one -on -one conversations that weren't put on the schedule, and I've had really great ideas come out of events like this um, in terms of policy. So I think just, you know, if you care, someone cares to listen, and so keep talking to people about the things that you want to change. I'll give you a state government lens on this because this is the world that I live in. There are no shortages of ideas. <laughs> And some of them, as, as Alexis says, was just, are not too small. But across this country on an annual basis, we have about 140,000 pieces of legislation across the country. And I get to work in both the state of California, who holds the, the mantle of having probably the most bills, and also I work in the state of North Dakota, who is one of those states who files some of the least number of bills. And what I've come to understand about our states that we live in and our legislature's reactions or actions proactively about what make good public policy is that's defined by the number of people who live within your state. So, uh, so I, I think we need to be remain sensitive always again about policy, about policy and be in the game about this. One of the things that agriculture I think has done very well is to be at the table. I think if we decide that we don't like how a, hurt, a certain agency behaves or, or that we think the outcomes are always bad, that's a bad decision for us not to be at the table because, because you see in evidence that people will make decisions accordingly and, and so you need to be there to help inform. And, and I think our, our industry is getting a lot better about that uh, so that we are um, helping to inform. We may not get our way, but at least we'll bring a perspective that otherwise would be absent. All right, I'll add very quickly. Uh, for the researchers in particular, uh, I would say lean into your curiosity. Whatever the curiosity was that brought you to your research and got you diving deep into that, keep, keep going with it. And, and you don't have to be you know, this unrepentant policy geek like myself. To be, you don't have to be stuck in it every day. But every once in a while, look up and think about how that can be applied. Look for those opportunities and use your curiosity, again, to, to really think about what, where that research can go because the opportunities are incredible and the work we, that you all are doing here is incredible and has a lot of application. So with that, I, uh oh. I'm going to throw in one thought of my own here, something we do very, very well in Illinois, which is um, cross-sector communication, collaborations, and partnerships. Um, ultimately, the policy process is um, that elephant problem where people have different hands on the uh, elephant and are describing it. And um, it comes together in different directions, sometimes bottom up, sometimes top down, sometimes from every direction. But the more we can have uh, cross-sector communication and then projects and public-private partnerships and other things where different perspectives come together. Um, that can create a lot of momentum and get things done. I have a question. Great. I'm going to aim this at you, Jonathan. Uh, the question is from Bob Coverdell of Air Scout. The over-application of nitrogen on corn is increasingly in the news. A recent report showed that despite growers' efforts, no change in nitrogen runoff into waterways has been realized. Do you think regulation will be required to affect a real reduction of runoff? If yes, what would be the most effective policy? I like, I don't, Bob, I don't know why you're trying to get me in trouble first thing here in the morning. Um, that is an extraordinarily good and incredibly difficult question uh, to answer. Um, so let me try very briefly. Do I think regulation is the pathway on this? I personally hope not because I don't think regulation is going to be particularly effective, particularly over a long ter term, the size, scope, and scale of this set of challenges. So we have been trying to use the voluntary conservation investment method. Um, I would like to see us do more and better with that. Um, in fact, you know, I, this, this idea that, that we put a minimum amount of investment in conservation in our policy and then expect miracles to happen on the ground, I think is part of our problem. So I do think there's a lot more that can be done in that space long before we get into a regulatory kind of environment. It, I just caution on it in general because I think trying to regu regulate uh, in fields across uh, even the state of Illinois would be a massive, massive challenge. Justin? 
Hi, just a quick question as we're talking about incentivizing funding into these really capital intensive innovation areas. So we think about tech hubs as an example. I think when we originally conceptualized it, it was supposed to be half a billion dollars to communities. Now I believe this one that we're going about to talk about is competing for about 65 million. So there's a huge gap between that and half a billion. But also realizing that so much of these chips and science investments require a significant amount of investment at state levels as well. What are your thoughts on sort of galvanizing this level of public sector investment to better incentivize and in research? I think you'll hear a good bit about this at the next panel, so I don't want to take away from that at all. Um, but yesterday we had an event celebrating IFAB, and I think the conversation was there's over $600 million of state level investment going into this. Um, and I think that's a testament to how important these investments are, first of all, is that there's so much desire for this that the, you know, the entire sector, every sector across the state has come together to get this across the finish line. But again, I'm not going to take away from that specifically. Um, I think public-private partnerships are something that we should be leveraging more. You know, in the ag space, we have Foundation for Food and Ag Research. We have a fellow at U of I who's a, who's a FFAR fellow. Um, and that program is, I think it's one federal dollar gets a dollar forty cents matched um, from private companies. Um, RCPP is a really important program. The ADM is involved in out of the farm bill. Um, and I think I think you speak to a great point that we need to better leverage these because there is interest and there is engagement in them. And if we have a funding problem at the federal level, how do we how do we solve that? You know, via industry. We'll take one last question from over. The on the left. Hi, um, this is kind of building on Stephen's last question, but what can companies and researchers in the biotechnology sector do to support ag policy in regards to gene edited crops? I would say if you're around here, talk to Steve, <laughs> and Steve can get you a meeting, <laughs> first of all. Um, but, you know, I think that's, that's one of those sensitive topics, understandably. Um, and I think it's important to understand where consumers are and how to meet people where they are. Um, nobody in this space is acting in bad faith. Folks who are very pro-GM come from it from a very pro-science perspective. And me personally, as a private citizen, I'm not afraid of genetically modified crops, and I'm OK with that. But folks who are are genuinely fearful for their health. And that's not because they think that it's bad or evil or mean. But to better, you know, I think there's, there needs to be an education perspective to that. How can you, you know, explain to people what is and is not safe for them to consume? Um, and I don't know if that's a question that the government can necessarily answer. <laughs> so. Well, I'll just add something that came from the, one of the earlier panel where they talked about the sort of um, the level of importance of different things. So the outsourcing, you know, outsourcing the dishwasher but not hugging my kids or putting them in the bed. I think in general in this space, to Alexi's point, this is food, these are consumers. And so this set of issues has to really be worked through. And I think what we see in some of the, the pushback isn't just a, um, a simple, well, you, you don't understand or you don't know it. If there's a lack of understanding, lack of knowledge in this, this is a huge challenge that has to be tackled and it can't just sort of be pushed through because again, this is about feeding your kids. This is about eating. And so the level of, uh, at which you in, inter, interact with that or engage with that issue is really important. And that goes from researchers all the way through policy. I wish I had a, like a more clear answer of what that would look like, but I think that's clearly something that has to be kept in mind. These consumer-based issues are really important, and particularly on something like food, we have got to be more cognizant of that and work through it, I think even before the policy space. I, again, I, don't, I agree with Alexa, there's not like a policy solution for this, um, in part because I think just the, the, the blunt instrument reality of it at times. Um, I think we're ready to wrap. Um, I wanna thank everyone here for your time on this topic. We're entering a break, so this is the perfect time to chase this down if you have additional questions. And I just wanna add my thanks to this panel. Greg, Alexi, Jonathan, thank you very much for, for being part of this.